وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters I was saying maybe after seven eight sessions when you know the the audience begins to decline I said we'll figure out who the core people are but uh, alhamdulillah I think we figured it out today because of the the snowstorm and the snow mashallah it's a uh, Good to see the uh, efforts uh, brothers and sisters are putting in for these sessions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, points and questions that were raised after last week's session, and I just want to go over uh, some of those things before we move on uh, with the tafsir. And uh, I want to basically recap some of those things. One of the things I mentioned in the last session uh, was this reference to cliches. And I said we are a community that is built on cliches, correct? And I even uh, said that there is some literature that is written on this topic. So I want to actually quote, uh, uh, mention some of these books, book names that you guys can write down. And these are not even by Muslims. These are just by uh, Western uh, you know, academics and so on who have written about this topic. Uh, I'll try to reference you know, English literature. So for example, one of the books is called The Tyranny of Cliches, How Liberals Cheat in the War of Ideas. Okay, published 2013 by Jonah Goldberg. Uh, a second book is called On Clichés, The Super Sidure of Meaning by Function in Modernity, written in 1979 by Anton, I can't even pronounce the last name, I think it, maybe it's like Russian or something, Zij Derveld or something. And a third book, which is also very interesting, is called Clichés of Liberalism, Governing Through Insult, Confusion, and Sound Bites. David Wilcox, published in 1999, okay? So you can see this idea of cliches that I was saying our communities are built on cliches as well. It's actually a pretty big phenomenon in the Western world. I and mean, we just adapt to it because we're living in this society. I'm gonna quote actually uh, a, uh, a post or an article uh, which I have not published on my website for those of you who know I have a website. So this is exclusive, exclusive content. So these are just you know thoughts I write down uh, so I had written this and then uh, because the second half I thought it would get too uh, controversial so I just I have been hesitating to publish it but I'll quote the first half of it. Uh, it's about cliches, it's about cliches and some of it is referenced from uh, these, these books that I have written as well, uh, I've mentioned. Just to give you an idea, you know what are cliches? Because of their repetitive use in social life, people don't really think about the precise meanings of cliches, yet they will hear it and incorporate it into their ongoing social interactions. Clichés penetrate into man's consciousness and to influence behavior, and influence behavior on, on the attitudinal, attitudinal level, basically your attitudes. While potential relativizations are being excluded because cognitive reflections are being avoided. Okay? Meaning what? We, with clichés, you universalize that statement and completely ignore the fact that, look, some of these statements can have exceptions, some of them can have, you know, uh, some relativity in them, some sub subjectivity in them. So cliches don't allow you to do that. The cliche has to be repeated over and over again in order to achieve the thoughtless, mechanical response it's set out to elicit. Cliches are unavoidable. Okay, you cannot avoid cliches totally, okay. But a conscious effort can be made to use them critically to clarify them as much as possible within the frame of reference of the whole argument. Modern society fosters the use of cliches in language and behavior to such an extent that they become tyrannical, oppressive. A traditional, so now this is a more, uh, you know, a summar, summarized uh, definition of it. A, the sociological essence of a cliché consists of the supersedure, supersedure means like it supersedes everything else, of original meanings by social functions. This is caused by repetitive use and enhanced by the avoidance of reflection. So remember last time I gave an example of a cliche and I said, look, it actually just takes you a minute or two to think about it, reflect upon it, and you will realize, yeah, this, is not, this cannot really be you know, universalized for every single instance. So this is what this is saying. And this is not written by Muslims. This is just the phenomenon of cliche. Anyone can come and observe it. And we often see this happening during disputes and disagreements where people will refer back to a cliché to argue their point. In the larger Western world, one may hear, violence never solves anything. 
Peace cannot be achieved through violence. You know, democratic duties, freedom, our nation's interests, etc., etc. Okay, so you can see this even in the Western political world. You know, liberals, conservatives, they're always dropping these cliches to argue back with one another. You know, I mean, the U.S. is the best example. You know, our nation's interests and our, our democratic this and our whatever, all the stuff that they say, these are cliches. You know, they don't allow you to even think beyond that. And they're so, you know, society is so emotionally attached to it that the moment you try to, uh, you know, you, can, you will not crit critique it because it's not allowing you to even think about it critically. Okay, so this is something I want, this is from last week, okay, this is from last week. And another thing I also mentioned was about this, uh, uh, the Arabic language. Uh, remember the sister at the back was also saying, you know, importance of Arabic. So there is another book called uh, Concentric Circles, um, Nurturing Awe and Wonder in Early Learning, a Foundational Approach. So in the field of Islamic pedagogy, okay, pedagogy is the, uh, the field of how do you educate uh, how, do you how do you educate, okay? And there are different, obviously, levels so that, you know, the way you educate in university is very different than the way you educate at, for example, at a kindergarten level or in the uh, elementary school, high school level, whatever. So there's a lot of uh, recent literature has been written on Islamic pedagogy. So this is one of those books, Concentric Circles. It talks about the idea on how Muslim teachers and Muslim educators can nurture awe Okay, and wonder in, within children when they look at the cosmos, when they look at the world. Anyways, uh, you know, that's not the point. Uh, the book, I, 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 I'll bring the book next week. Uh, I couldn't bring it today. But within that uh, book, there's a very interesting section about the Arabic language. Okay, and this is written in the context of Islamic schools, Islamic education. So look what the scholar is writing. His name is Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal. Okay, he's a, a Western trained uh, Muslim scholar, traditional. It's a little bit long, but pay attention to what he says. In respect to language acquisition, Muslims have always recognized that among all the languages of the world, Arabic has a special place because it is the language chosen by the Creator for the final revelation to humanity when He chose to send the Quran in clear Arabic. Arabic is also the language of the Noble Prophet, whose words and deeds are a constant source of guidance for Muslims. In addition, a majority of primary sources for the study of Islam and its civilization are in Arabic. So everything is in Arabic. Thus, one of the most important decisions to be made by schools and parents in respect to teaching and learning of languages is about the status of Arabic in the curriculum. In non-Arabic societies, schools and home educators show considerable divergence. Maybe they're confused, they don't know exactly you know, how to go about this, about their approach to Arabic. Certain schools teach Arabic as a second language, others simply ignore it, and still others had a, ha, add a simplified and often inadequate dose of Arabic through an Islamic studies program. We have a couple of Islamic schools, they all have, Islam, they all have Arabic by the way, all the major Shia and Sunni Islamic schools, they have Arabic, but you probably wonder why after you know, 8 years or 12 years, how come nobody knows Arabic? Because of the problem in the way that they are adding it to the, to the curriculum. So this is what they're saying, like no one's going to learn the way you're teaching it. This confusion, this is the relevant part. This confusion is a recent phenomenon introduced into the educational systems of Muslim societies through the colonization of their lands by European powers. Inshallah, at a later opportunity, I will talk about how, uh, you know, when, when, a, uh, when a relevant ayah comes, inshallah, I will talk about how modern education systems uh, have a lot of problems in it, inshallah. But he's saying the same thing, that this is a recent phenomenon introduced into the educational systems of Muslim societies through the colonization of their lands by European powers. Previous to this experience, Arabic had the status of lingua franca, Latin for, um, you know, the mainstream language. You know, every, if you wanted to talk about Islam, you need to, know, you need to have known Arabic. It had this status throughout traditionally Muslim lands. Every educated Muslim, okay, it's not talking about scholars in the house or anything, no, every educated Muslim learned Arabic as the language of scholarship. The ability to read and write Arabic was not an exception, and this made hundreds of years of Islamic scholarship available to educated Muslims. Just by the mere fact that you are an educated Muslim in, in Muslim societies, you knew the Arabic language, that allowed you to remain connected to the entire Islamic tradition. The vast corpus of Arabic texts, in turn, 
provided access and attachment to the entire intellectual tradition of Islam. During the last three centuries, the situation has dramatically changed. Today, approximately only 15% of the world's 1.5 billion Muslims have direct access to the language of revelation and to a formidable tradition of scholarship which provides a profound understanding of life and its di dilemmas. This is the unmaking of a living tradition at a mega scale, a most horrible exper experiment in social engineering. Okay. This is the state that we are in. This is the state that we are in. Regarding some of these terms like, you know, what is a living tradition and what are all these things, maybe inshallah some other time I can mention these. But if you want to learn about what is a living tradition, I have a, a course by, with Mizan Institute called The History of Aza, The History of Azadari. I've even given it as a majlis, but with Mizan I went into a lot more depth. Over there I spoke about what is a living tradition, what does it mean? So uh, this is what they're saying, that when you stop learning Arabic, when you don't know the language, you have cut yourself off from Islam, which is actually a living tradition. You don't have any access to your, to your lifeline, basically. Okay? So we need to understand this. So this is, inshallah, you know, these are just points from last week. I just wanted to bring up these references. Well, I'll mention one more. We talked about the, um, the qalam. We talked about you know, the pen being the tool, you know, and so on. We talked about the printing press. This is a very interesting book. Once again, it's in English. You know, whatever English sources I have, I'll try to bring them. It's called Rediscovering the Islamic Classics, How Editors and Print Culture Transformed an Intellectual Tradition. So this is, the first two chapters will probably make you cry. Like literally, I, I literally had tears in my eyes because it's showing how the West was, uh, after the printing press, how they were really, you know, moving forward. And the Muslims were just sleeping, like they're just like, huh, what is this? Get you, you know, like printing press, like what? So they caught up so late, but you know, after chapter two, it gets actually very interesting. Even I, you know, I learned it in this book. They showed how finally, when the Muslims caught up, they they caught up very good. And I mentioned it in last session as well. You know, we have caught, we had, we did catch up, but now I, I'm saying that you know now it's a digital age. So over there, you know, we want to make sure that we don't fall back behind once again. So these are just uh, points from last session. Inshallah, we're going to continue today. I will just read the couple of ayat again. It's a short surah, so I'll try to read as much as uh, every time we get an opportunity, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. Allama al-insana ma lam ya'alam. كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرَّاهُ اسْتَغْنَى إِنَّا إِلَى رَبِّكَ الرُّجْعَى أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَى أَوْ أَمَرَ بِالتَّقْوَى أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى كَلَّا لَئِنْ لَمْ يَنْتَهِ لَنَسْفَعًا بِالنَّاصِيَةِ نَاصِيَةٍ كَاذِبَةٍ خَاطِئَةٍ فَلْيَدْعُوا نَادِيَةٍ سَنَدْعُوا الزَّبَانِيَةِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ As I said, we don't, uh, we have, I haven't read the last ayah because of the wajib sajda. Okay. Next discussion we can have here is, in the first five ayat, I had said that these ayat, the first five ayat are very, very caring. Okay, it's talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, look, I have created you, I am your Lord. I have created you, uh, recite in the name of your Lord who has created you. And I created you from an alaq, from a blood clot. And then, I, and that, that is my generosity, that I created you, and I uh, nourished you, and I, I did tarbiyah of you. And not only that, I'm also akram because I taught you. I taught you how to use the pen. And I taught you all of that which you did not know. Okay, so this is something which is in the first five ayat, very, very, you know, the, the tone also is very, you know, caring. All of a sudden, the next uh, set of ayat is going to become extremely harsh. And it's a very sudden shift. It's a very, very sudden shift. It's not even like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even give you an opportunity to be like, okay, let's gradually you know, go through this. No, no. It says, Allah taught that, uh, Allah taught insan that which he did not know. Kalla. Kalla, this kalla over here means definitely, we'll get to it. Kalla inna al-insana la yatra. Okay, definitely, despite all of this generosity, insan dastughyan. 
insan does tra it transgresses it commits transgression okay why does it commit transgression how what makes an insan commit transgression Tughyan, he well it's not he over here it's insan is, uh, is men and women they see themselves as istaghna meaning they see themselves as needless you know we don't need anybody okay, we don't need god while they don't realize that inna ila rabbika ruja that their return would be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and then it goes on inshallah we'll get to the next ayat over here i want to focus on another theme here is that what these ayat are saying is that on the one hand allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous he has created you he has made you from a very tiny you know blood clot and then you know you grow up and you become one of the most noble creations of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time, you know, you are uh, insan, despite all of these uh, favors and blessings, does tughyan, becomes arrogant. And over here, one of the themes we are going to understand here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you must cultivate humility and wisdom within yourselves. Okay, there's an ethical theme over here being mentioned. This is very interesting. You know, why in the first surah, the focus is on humility? Okay, because when Allah says, I created you, and I created you from a blood clot, this means you should be humble. Okay, who are you? you are, we are the ones, Allah is the one who created you. So this humility should be there, but contrast that with the tughyan. Tughyan means crossing all borders and uh, barriers. Okay, if there's a border here that you're not supposed to cross, it's not only just crossing the border, it's literally going way beyond the border. Okay, there's a difference, inshallah, in some other sections, we talk about isyan and tughyan. What is the difference? Isyan is also a sort of crossing of a border, like a limit. But Tughyan is like really, really going beyond you know, all, all barriers. And that's why they're called Taghut. They literally cross all barriers. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, look, despite God having bestowed everything to you, you know, Allah has given you the ability to write. Allah has given you the ability to, to transmit knowledge from one generation to another generation. He has given so many gifts to humans, uh, you know, but yet they will resist this, uh, you know, this learning process. They will resist it. Why? Because they will start to feel arrogant. They will start to feel, uh, you know, istikbar. They will start to feel that, you know, they're, self, uh, they're, they're needless. Istagna is from mustaghni. Mustaghni means, uh, you know, somebody who is rich is called ghani. Ghani means rich. Why? Because they don't need money. They don't need anybody's money. Istagna, istagna means somebody who seeks to, or who thinks that they are uh, needless. Okay? It's not even somebody truly uh, needless, they just think that they are needless. Over here, I want to actually touch upon this idea of humility and link it with some you know, discussions in Western context as well. As I said, in this, sur in this tafsir, I want to try and link it back to our day and age as much as possible. Look, humility, if you ever went to school, public schools, you know, most of us probably went to public schools and you know, universities, you probably never were taught or you were probably never encouraged to have this moral uh, quality called humility, okay? I went to school too, you know, don't try to cheat me, I went to the same schools here. There's not a, it's not an ethical quality that is promoted, you know? Instead, what is promoted is this, you know, confidence, okay, confidence, um, you know, and we're not against confidence, but this confidence is tied to yourself. You know, everything you do, it's you. It's all about you at the end of the day, okay? Whereas, the framework in which the Western, co Western society is pushing that in, this idea of confidence, you know, self-esteem and so on, it's not, you know, Islamically it's not wrong. We're, we're okay, we're going to say, yeah, in Islam we promote confidence. You should be confident, you should be, you know, uh, when you speak to someone, have confidence. But the framework in which they are teaching this is a framework of individualism and a framework of humanism, meaning that when you are confident and you have a certain talent, it's just you. It's not, don't attribute this uh, quality to anybody else. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, no, I taught you how to read and write, and I created you this creation, this talent, this knowledge. At the end of the day, Islam is expecting you to continuously attribute this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your khaliq, okay? In the Western context, there's a reason why they don't have this, uh, they, they don't mention this idea of humility too much. Before the era of enlightenment, meaning before the 17th century, obviously the Western world is dominated by Christian thought, right? In Christianity, they have this idea of the original sin of Adam alayhi salam, where they say Prophet Adam committed a sin and that resulted in his decline, in his fall, he was kicked out of heaven. And basically, all of us are essentially, you know, a product of that, uh, that original sin. 
that Adam committed and we just have to suffer because of that and we have to continuously feel you know this feeling of lowliness you know, we are nothing you know we don't have uh, anything we have to sort of go back up you know that's kind of what the uh, whole idea is and Christian uh, you know societies were actually built on this framework okay so they had this one idea so this is not humility this is literally like low self-esteem almost okay like literally you're nothing you're nothing in Islam we don't have that we have a balance I'll get to it we don't have this idea of like, you know, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. No, no. We are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. We have to appreciate that. But inshallah, I'll talk about how we can balance this. So you have this idea of feeling of loneliness. In the Enlightenment, in the Enlightenment, when rational thought and, you know, this denial of God ended, uh, come, ended up emerging, once you remove God from the picture, then who are you supposed to feel lowly in front of and who are you supposed to feel humility in front of? Okay, it's just you, okay? So in 17th, 18th century, humility is actually not seen as a virtue at all. Humility is completely taken out of the discourse, okay? Because the higher power to whom you're supposed to show humility is now gone, out of the picture. And many philosophers, Western philosophers like Spinoza, uh, David Hume, and many, many of them, they would say, you know, humility is when you have a higher authority. When there is no higher authority, it's all about you, then you know, humility doesn't make sense. You're not going to lower yourself in, from, in front of another creation. Okay, so this, this idea, it began to be stopped seeing as a moral virtue and we are still in that era, like we still see remnants of that. It's not a quality that is pushed in our schools, in our education system. So we're not, we don't grow up with that, which is very interesting because even in Arabian society, humility is not really seen as a, as a virtue. Okay, look at, the, look at the parallels. Inshallah, we'll talk about tribal humanism today as well. So it's not seen. Today, some Christian uh, theologians are trying to you know reignite that discussion about humility they're trying to reignite it but you know I don't want to talk about that what about in Islamic ethics in Islamic ethics from day one from the first ayah humility is built into the religion okay now over here you have two set you have to divide humility towards uh, in two in two divisions one type of humility you show towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator okay this has no exceptions at all times, at all stages, in all circumstances, you have to continuously show humility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning this humility is always going to be in the heart. And then you have the creation, the rest of the people over there as well. You have to continuously show humility towards other people, except in certain instances, for example, if there are tyrants or there are oppressors, over there, no, we have to you know, change the way we behave in front of them. We may have to show the this, this sense of pride in front of them. That's a different, those are exceptional cases. Don't want to talk about that. But generally speaking, you know, amongst a group of, you know, just humans and spe especially Muslims and especially the believers, the mu'mineen, we should always have a relationship of, hu uh, of humility. Our interactions should always be of humility. Now there are many ayat in the Quran and there's two different uh, Arabic words for this. Sometimes it's referred to in Arabic as khushu and sometimes it is referred to as tawadu. Okay, these two words are usually used to mean, uh, you know, to indicate humility. The opposite of humility is istikbar. Okay, it's istikbar. Istikbar, once again, is to feel, feel uh, from kabira, kabira like uh, big, right? Allahu Akbar, Akbar means big and great or greater. Istikbar, okay, I'll just mention a, a, a cool thing for you all. I shared it with one of the you know grade seven eight students um, in one of the in, in the school, but uh, I'll I'll teach it to you guys as well. It's a cool trick. They really enjoyed it. In Arabic, the entire Arabic language, uh, brothers and sisters, is actually built on patterns. The entire, like literally, the surah. If I read it, I can turn it into like patterns. Okay. So in the Hausa, when we learn Arabic, we learn patterns. We don't learn like the vocabulary. Okay. We learn patterns, patterns, patterns. So there are so many different patterns, right? So for example, there's a pattern called mif'al. This is the pattern, you just have to learn it, mif'al, okay? Mif'al, this pattern, if any root word of Arabic comes on this pattern, it means like a tool or instrument, okay? So for example, fataha, fataha means to open, correct? If you bring fataha on mif'al, it becomes miftah, meaning a key to open up a door, okay? Sabh or subh means light or, you know, morning. If you put it on mif'al, it becomes Misbah, meaning a tool to show light, right? So that's cool, right? There's also a pattern called istif'al. Istif'al, okay? Over here, it's the same root word. Istaghna, istakbara, 
Meaning what? Istif'al means the root word, when you put on it, it means the person is trying to seek it. They're trying to seek it, okay? They may not even get it, okay? They may not even uh, actually achieve it, but they're seeking it. There's talab in it. There's a desire for it, okay? So look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the word istighna, meaning they don't, they're not needless. They're seeking. They're thinking that they are needless. Istikbar, they're not, they're not big. They're thinking that they are big. Okay, so this is a very interesting thing. There's many patterns. Sometimes if I'm in the mood, I'll, I'll drop these patterns in, inshallah. Okay, there's many. Istikbar, uh, anyways, some of them are from like fiqh and stuff. I don't want to mention those. So, over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, uh, so sorry, in, 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 in the idea of humility, humility, uh, sorry, uh, yes, humility is the opposite of that is istikbar, arrogance. Okay, or tughiyan, like crossing all board of borders and boundaries. Why do you cross borders and boundaries? Because you see yourself as needless. If you are needless, that means you don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the picture. You, it's only you. And it's just very, very interesting. And I hope you can all understand how the first, the first ethical vice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling out in the Quran is arrogance. This is the first uh, uh, you know, uh, crime that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling out. And I also want to quote uh, Surah Baqarah, Ayah 34. Because this is also the crime of Iblis. When uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ we said, to the, we said to the angels, do sajda to Adam. فَسَجَدُوا They all did sajda. إِلَّا Iblis. Iblis did not do sajda. What, why? Aba, He refused. وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرَ he thought he was big and bad. وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ And he became from those who were kafirin, meaning he knowingly did not obey. He knowingly rejected the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so this is something which is very important. The first crime that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting in this surah is actually that of tughyan, istikbar, istighna. You know, humans feeling that they are just needless. They don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's just all them. Okay, so... Yes, the nature of individualism has changed today, but it was exi existing even in Arabia. And as I said, inshallah, I will mention after the discussion of humility. When it comes to humility, what are some of the signs that we should be, you know, that we can see? Like, what is a sign of humility? Okay. The Muslim scholars, you know, Sunni, Shia, all of them have mentioned a couple of signs by which you can tell that, you know, a person is humble. Okay, they really are humility. They are humble. One of the signs is, you know, it's not... It's not, it should not be faked, okay? Humility cannot be faked, okay? And this happens, okay? Some people, maybe they go sit one session with, you know, in front of Ayatollah Bahjiz or someone, and, uh, you know, they come out of that session, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, their shoulders are down, and, you know, head is down, and, Assalamu alaikum, brother, yes. You know, as if, like, they have seen, like, I don't know, the Malakut and Jabarut, and I don't know what. You know, they've gone to the highest realms, and, look, bro, like, yesterday you were, I don't know, you know, playing ping pong at council, you know, and I saw you how you were playing, you know, you weren't like this. You know, these changes don't happen overnight, okay? These changes don't happen overnight. These take over, and even if they do happen, like, I doubt anyone acts like this. I remember before we went to Qom, there was all these stories of Ayatollah Bahja. He doesn't even look at you because he can see your reality. He doesn't even talk. He doesn't even do this. He doesn't even do that. I went to see him, and I was like, man, he's just, he's normal. Like, why are you making... A, such a weird description of him. Well, he was normal. He said salam to us. He saw, looked at us. And you know, funny thing is, some people, when he saw, looked at another brother, they were like, oh, he's looking at you, man. Something's like seriously wrong with you. Like, you know? No, like, that's not how the ulama act. And we sat with so many ulama. Alhamdulillah, they were all normal. Yes, they had akhlaq. They were speaking. They would talk. Nobody fakes humility. You cannot fake it. Okay? So, this is something that's very, very important. This is a story that a sheikh saw this man. You know, this is one of these fables that exist, you know. This, he saw a man who was just walking with his head down, his shoulders were bent forward, very tense, you know. State of apparent, like, lowliness, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. And the shaykh said to him, you know, khushu lies over here. Your humility lies in the heart, not over here, not on your shoulders. Don't, you know, make yourself like this to make it seem like somehow it's going to get, you know, instilled in your heart. That's not how it comes. From inside, it needs to come outside. Not from outside, it goes inside. Okay, this is something very important. Another sign of humility is that w when you want to help individuals, you help without any discrimination. Tall, short, you know, black, white, color, none of this rich, poor, none of this makes any difference to you when you want to, let's say, help someone. 
you as a person, okay, as a, let's say you're a position of power or somebody who can assist someone, regardless of who the individual is, you know, you don't see that quality in them and say, you know, I'm going to help this person because they're rich, but this person I'm not going to help them. No, this is also, uh, you know, not doing that is also a sign of humility. Okay, so I, I treat everybody equally. This was a big problem in Arabian society because the slaves were treated, you know, uh, why are there so many narrations where the Prophet, it says the Prophet would sit with the slaves? Because it was a big deal. It was a big deal. It's not, a, it's not something that, that was common in Arabia. So for the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming and sitting, you know, with a slave, it's shocking for the Arabian society. You know, what are you, what are you doing? So this is something that is important, okay? Another quality or no, another sign of humility is that, and I gave this example earlier in one of the, in, I think the Thursday night I came, I gave this example as well. Humility is to be able to not feel anything, like not feel this, you know, great excitement when you actually achieve uh, in something or, you know, are successful in something. An example I tried to give is that, imagine you are playing, you know, a soccer match or whatever, you know, I, I like cricket, so cricket match, and, you know, your opponent beats you in, your, in the match, right, basketball, whatever, you know, any, any of these competitive sports, your opponent beats you, how do you truly feel about that, you know? You know, yes, sportsmanship may be there, but you're not so excited, you're like, I got, I got smashed, you know, you beat me in the match, and, you know, so that lack of feeling that you have when your opponent defeats you, okay, if you can feel the same way about your own, you know, success, that is also a sign of humility. Why? It's like you come out of your, you know, imagine like you, your soul comes out and you see your body just walking around. And you know, you look at yourself as another, as another person. And then this other person is, you know, uh, gaining victories in life, they're getting different types of success in life. But, you know, that feeling that you have is like, okay, there's somebody else, you know, got these victories. It's not about you. If you can have this, if you can build this and train this, and in that context say that, you know, all these victories, all of these success, all of these things that I'm getting are, at the end of the day, it's not from me, it's not mine, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is also a sign of humility, okay, a sign of humility, okay. Um, and some of the scholars have said, the, among the signs of its realization is an intensification, meaning an intensity of the desire to have neither rank nor standing among people. Okay, they don't, you know, not having any desire to have any position. Why all these stories about marj, marj, you know, different maraje, when sometimes, you know, you would have two marjas, only two marjas, for example, you know, people would insist, Ayatollah Fana, please you take up, you know, the marja'iyah. Why are they running away? They have no desire for these things, you know. You know, circumstances may make it that, you know, one of them may have to end up taking that role, you know, but they don't. You know, uh, there's a video of Ayatollah Khamenei, Sayyid Khamenei, when he was elected as the wali, not elected, like chosen as the wali faqih, uh, the parliament, uh, you know, video is there, it's on YouTube. You know, and he starts crying when they chose him. And you can see, he's like, what, what are you guys doing? You know, like, I don't want this role. Uh, and he says, you know, we all have to shed tears of blood. If you think, you know, I'm, if you all thought I'm deserving of this, you know, I don't want this role at all. You know, but whatever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own, uh, you know, uh, decisions, but that is the level, that is the level. But in our, in our context, in the Western world, for example, that's not the context, like, that's not really, literally not the context, everybody wants that power, like, we want that power, right? So that's something which is very important. Another mark of humility is to have, you know, is to think high of others, have a good estimation of them, have husnul dhan, have a positive attitude toward other people, okay? Meaning, uh, instead of seeing others below you, yourself, okay? You perceive them as somebody who are, someone who is dignified at your level at the very least, okay? Don't look at them as somebody who are superior because, you know, sometimes, you know, what we do is we, we judge people based off of their, you know, as I said, you know, the shoulders, for example. Somebody may not have those shoulders, you know, drooped down, but inside their heart, they may be the most pious person. And these are things that, you know, I don't have to repeat them. Ulama have mentioned these things so many times for all of you. So this is something that is also important. A last sign that some of the ulama have mentioned is that a sign of humility is the person consciously avoids getting into quarrels and arguments. Okay? Because quarrel, quarreling and argument, arguing is a sign that you always want to be right. Okay? You always want to be right. Okay? That's why the Quran even says when the uh, you know the the jahil people 
uh, when they when when you're when you're conversing with the jahil people, you know they're not gonna stop talking. They all wanna be right. You know, qalu salama. Just say salam. You know, peace to you, and you know, just leave them. You, know, you should not have the desire that you know I'm gonna like I'm gonna have the last word, even with the jahil people. So this is something that is also very very important. So. As I said, a summary of signs of humility are that you know you should have your khidmah, your services should be for all people. You know you shouldn't discriminate. You should think uh, well of people. Husnul dhan, okay, have an open mind toward other people. Uh, have this absence of this feeling of entitlement. Okay, you should not have a desire to be treated like unique and I'm special. You know, no, these are all you know uh, problematic uh, you know attitudes to have. This attitude of you know the savior complex that you know, many Western governments have that you know, we will come save you. you know, we will show you how to live your life. Even on an individual level, we should not have that. You know, I'm going to come and tell you how to live your life or you know, I'm going to save you. No, the savior complex should not be there. It's also an issue for you know, Hausa students as well. You know, I, in the first year or two, in the first, first year I guess it was, went to a scholar with you know, some of my friends. And you know, when a lot of students go in, uh, there's this Think of like, okay, you know, what am I going to do after eight, ten years? You know, tabligh and resident alim and this and that. And you know, the scholar says something very interesting. He says, why are you trying to figure out what you have to do, like your responsibility? You know, as if like when I finish these studies, I'm I'm going to become resident alim. The scholar says something very interesting. He said, look, this is not even your job. This is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has brought you from there and He's put you here. And he will put you and use you wherever you, he, you know, he feels that you're fit to be used. And the sign of tawakkul and the sign of trust that you're going to have is that imagine you become the greatest student in Qom. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to use you in some, you know, some place where you, know, where you least expect it. If you are content with that role, that's when you know that you have not only humility, but you also have complete content in Allah's uh, decision. Okay? This is the level. This is the level that we are supposed to get at. Okay, there are some other discussions here. You know, um, dangers of you know not balancing humility with uh, you know uh, low self-esteem. That I'm gonna so you know sometimes humility. We don't want to turn it into the Christian concept of you know, just low self-esteem and you know we're just nobodies. Over here, I'll quote one of the uh, contemporary you know scholars, theologians here, where he summarizes this. That, you know, what's the difference between humility and low self-esteem? If you can write it down, it's a good catchy phrase. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Okay? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Don't think, oh, I'm just a nobody, you know, I'm just, you know, useless. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's low self-esteem. And low self-esteem is a problem because you're trying to compare yourself with other people. That's when you have low self-esteem. Oh, this person has this, this person has that. You know, this person, you know, I wish I had this. That results in low self-esteem. Hum that's not humility. Humility is to think of yourself less. Okay, like don't occupy your mind just thinking about yourself. You know, I'm like this, I'm like that, I'm like this, I'm like that. No, that's, you know, that is essentially uh, what is a sign of humility. Over here, um, one last thing I want to say here is one of the advantages of being humble and having humility, okay, and this is a recurring theme also in the Quran it will come, is that it's also a source of protection for you. Okay, it is actually a source of protection. Why? Because when you are not humble, you know, when you have this istikbar, this kibr, this pride, this arrogance, this tughyan, or this feeling of need, you know, needlessness, you know, I don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will make a lot of grand claims, you will make a lot of you know, big claims, and you know, I am like this, or this is like that, or that is like this, and you are actually going to open your, uh, you know, open yourself to posi uh, possible humiliation later on, okay? But when you are humble in your claims, when you are humble in the statements you put forward, and let's just say you are also wrong afterwards, then there's less opportunity, less chance of you being humiliated. People will always say, yes, you know, at the end of the day, he did not make a big claim. This is also a part of something, you know, etiquettes of speech. You know, I, I mentioned yesterday as well, and, and in some of the house majlises, inshallah, once again, there's a lot of Quranic ayat that talk about speech. I will mention this point once again over there. When we speak, there are a lot of etiquettes of speaking. Okay, how do we speak? How should we not speak? Over there, I'll probably mention this again. That, you know, the way you speak, you have to be very, very careful. If you are not sure about something, then that has to be conveyed in how you say it. Okay, when we, used to, when we were studying, you know, 
Half the time the ulama are always like, yeah, you know, perhaps this ayah means this. It seems it means this. Apparently it's saying this. And it will get so frustrating. Like, what do you mean? Like, does it mean this or does it not mean this? No, but this is a sign of humility. They're saying, yes, apparently this ayah means this. Allahu alam. I could possibly be wrong. I'm not denying that fact. But when you are sure about something and you have done your due diligence, then yes, over there you say, you know, this is like this, this ayah means this. That's a different situation. But you'd be surprised if you actually started to be, you know, more humble. You'd be surprised how many of your statements would just become, it's possible this is the case. I think this is the case. You know, apparently this is the case. That's how much we don't know, actually. That's how much we don't know. And that's, you know, something that we want to look over here. I'll quote this uh, last narration here uh, on this topic of humility, which is derived from these ayat, from the, uh, I think this is from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I'm not mistaken. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It talks about, you know, uh, a person, uh, you know, qualities of some of the groups of people who will be in heaven. Uh, but over here, in the, one of the qualities he mentions is that, you know, a person, who does not find uh, flaws in a Muslim, okay? And, as, and if they do decide, uh, I'll just read it myself, I'll read the transition. A person who does not point out the flaws of another Muslim until they have negated the presence of that flaw from themselves. If I say this person, for example, is a liar, before I make that accusation, I want to first see, okay, wait, do I have that quality too? So until I have not removed, removed that quality, I will not attack and you know accuse this disbeliever and the prophet is saying or I'm sure I think it's the prophet or could is one of the imams a flaw will not cease to exist except that another flaw will take its place and become apparent for the person so let's say you remove this quality of lying you know and now it's like, okay now I can accuse this brother you know it's like you're gonna see that 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 lie is gonna get replaced with something else you have another flaw you have you're gonna be like, oh wait I gotta remove this as well and uh, the prophet is saying here that a flaw will continue to keep existing. That's how many flaws we have. It is sufficient that a person occupies themselves with finding their own flaws rather than other people's. Okay, stop worrying about other people, worry about yourself. Okay, so anyways, this is a discussion that I wanted to uh, highlight over here because this ayah, these ayat very initially are pointing out the crime of not being humble. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I'm the one who created you, I'm your Rabb, and not only that, I created you from a clot, from a blood clot, you know, and yes, after that, you grew and I nourished you, you, I taught you, I taught you all of that which you did not know, I'm so generous. And yet, you're going to do the complete opposite of humility, which is arrogance and pride and all of these qualities. So, this is, as I said, one of the first crimes that is being mentioned. Inshallah, I will come back to this, you know, after, after a break, I know, after this next discussion. So, over here, you can sort of pause that and we're going to move on to another discussion here. But I'm going to come back to this idea of rebellion and tribal humanism. Inshallah, I will come back. Okay. One of the questions I left off last session was that it says, Alladhi allama bil qalam. And we talked about the qalam. And qalam, as I said, is a tool, is an inscription, is a tool by which you inscribe, right? So the question that comes to mind here is that on the one hand, we are saying that the Arabian society is an illiterate society vast majority of them don't actually even, like they don't even read or write. Vast majority of them don't do that. Even as I said, after the Battle of Badr, one of the, uh, one of the ways that the mushrikeen who were taken as prisoners, the way they were uh, released was th the Prophet said, you come and teach, I think 10 or 14 Muslim uh, how to read or write. So that's how many Muslims did not even know how to read and write. So it was a big problem. So then why on earth is Allah mentioning the qalam? You know, Allah is the one who created you and I taught you how to use the pen. Imagine, as I said, um, imagine you go, you know, to a grade three, grade four class, okay, and uh, you know you go to the science class and you say you should thank your teacher who taught you how to use a telescope. The kids are gonna be like, "What do you mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I've never even seen a telescope in my life." It's kind of absurd if the class doesn't even know how to use a telescope. Since what does this even mean at that point, right? So that's kind of like the question here. Imagine the prophet goes to Arabian society. Allah is the one who taught you how to use the pen. They're going to be like, no, nah, he didn't. Like, we don't even know how to use the pen. So what is the point of this ayah? Like, what is the relevance? Over here, the relevance, in, you know, I covered in a lot more detail in the, in the thematic sira analysis. Um, but I will try and summarize it once again over here. And the way I titled it, I called it, 
this is actually an epistemic attack on the mushrikeen. Okay? Epistemic is just a fancy word. It's from the word epistemology. Epistemology, what is epistemology? Just very briefly. We all have different tools by which we gain knowledge. Okay, we have our aql, we have, I don't know, science, experimentation, we have revelation, wahi is also a tool, you know, maybe dreams are a way, you know, it's, it's a tool, at the end of the day, people get information in dreams, the prophets get information in dreams. But then, within epistemology, you also study the value of these tools. Is the aql, is the knowledge that you gain from the aql the same value as the knowledge you get from a dream? Some of you may say, yeah, but, you know, I don't believe that. But the knowledge you get from the aql, is not the same value as the knowledge from the dream. So this is what you study in epistemology. What has more value? Right now in Western epistemology, they will say us on revelation doesn't even exist, and metaphysics don't exist. So what has the greatest value? They will say science has the greatest value. Okay, so see, the value changes. In Islamic epistemology, we also have you know, a value system. So we say revelation actually is the greatest uh, val you know, source of knowledge. Uh, revelation, wahi. Then comes the aql, then comes induction, all, all those, you know, we have that. The early Meccan era, where the Muslims are being persecuted, there are different types of tactics the mushrikeen are using against the Prophet and against the, the Muslims. For example, they are torturing them, they are making fun of them, mocking them, they are even killing some of the Muslims and so on. One of the, the battles that is happening is actually an epistemic battle between the mushrikeen and, and the Prophet Okay, There's actually an epistemic battle. Why? The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming and saying that you, the elite of Mecca, okay, the elite of Mecca knew how to read and write, and they were also rich people. You elite of Mecca, what is the source of your knowledge firstly, and what value does this knowledge have? They're going to say the source of our knowledge is our forefathers. That's the source of our knowledge, most of it. And us ourselves are also the source of knowledge, and this has the highest value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming, going to come and say that well, as a matter of fact, this source of knowledge that you have, firstly, it could be wrong. Okay, there's other ayat in the Quran that say, you know, if your forefathers were wrong, would you just follow them in their misguidance? Uh, we will show that, yes, they would say, yeah, we will follow them in their misguidance. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming and devaluing this source of knowledge. And this forefathers, what does that, what does that mean anything? What, why does that have any value per se? Okay, what has value is the wahi. The, the mushrikeen will attack the Prophet back and they will try and make the wahi without any value. What will they say? They will say, no, 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 this is not wahi. This is, uh, uh, you know, shi'r. It's poetry. And the Prophet is majnoon. The Quran says, you know, وَمَا صَحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُون He's not majnoon. Majnoon, today in Arabic they will say it means insane. Okay, majnoon, right? Pagal, uh, as we say in Urdu. Majnoon in Arabic did not mean insane. It did not mean insane, okay? Majnoon, what it meant is that a person is sort of possessed by a jinn or being assisted by a jinn. So they used to believe there's a valley called the Valley of Abqar. Okay, the Arabians, the Jahil Arabs, they used to believe there's a valley called the Valley of Abqar and over there is a valley of jinns. And there are some very famous jinns that used to live there who would come and help the greatest of poets of Arabia. So some very famous poets like Imrul Qais, um, Antara bin Shaddad, and these very, very big poets whose poetry was actually hanging on the Kaaba. Okay, this, these poems, they're translated into English. They're called Al Mu'allaqat. Okay, Mu'allaqat, Mu'allaq means to be hanging. So these poems were hanging on the Kaaba. Okay, and these poetry is all about, you know, love and lust and, you know, you know, you know uh, whatever, you know, too many uh, people here, but uh, you can read it on your own. These were hanging on the Kaaba, so these were like masterpieces. But the Arabs believe that because they are masterpieces, there's no way that the poet himself came up with this. So they would have, you know, they would say, no, the, the jinns are helping them. And these jinns have names, by the way. I don't remember all the names right now. So they said the Prophet is a sha'ir, he's majnoon. Meaning this is poetry and he is being assisted by the jinns. If he is being assisted by the jinns, then what is the value of that? Is this going to be, is, like what is the truth value at that point? It's not the same as revelation anymore. There's nothing divine about it. Just like Imrul Qais came, just like Antara came, well, he also came and he will die. The Quran says, the mushrikeen say, he's just a man, he's just a poet, he's come, he's recited his poetry and he's also going to go away. The Quran is saying these ayat. Okay, so I'm saying there's actually an epistemic battle happening in Arabia. 
these ayat are coming and saying al allama bil qalam the prophet is coming and the prophet is not known in arabia to be someone who knows how to read and write okay whether he was literate illiterate that's a theological discussion maybe some other time we can discuss that but everybody agrees shi and sunni he was not seen as somebody who uses the pen okay He's not, he's not somebody who's accustomed to be seen, like he's not seen as somebody who writes contracts and you know, he's not known to be a person like that. This person is coming with a revelation and saying to the elite of Arabia, this knowledge that you have, that you possess, it is not even from you. This is also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, even the value that you're claiming for yourself is not from you. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is like, let's say, you know, let's bring those grade four children again. That so some student from grade four comes into a meeting with like all these NASA, uh, you know, astronauts and engineers, and this young child comes in, and you know, he just says, you know, this telescope over here, like the lens is like I don't know, you know, three millimeters, like you know, sh thinner than it should be. What are all these scientists gonna think? Like, they're gonna feel like, yo, <laughs> where did this child come from? They're definitely gonna feel that this is some genius kid, right? So I'm saying, look, this is kind of what's happening here on, a, on, a, on an adult level where the mushrikeen are, they're saying, you know, this, this, this man, Muhammad, he doesn't know how to read or write. Like, who is he? Yes, he's, very, he's a very good you know, merchant, but he's not somebody who knows how to read and write. He's not from the elites of Mecca. He's not from the elite. He's coming and saying, you know, this, this pen that you guys use, you know, this is not even from you. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's kind of how they're, like, it's a direct challenge. It's a tahaddi. Tahaddi means that it's a challenge to the Arabs. You know, you want to bring it, come bring it on. Bring it on. Actually, that's how the ayah ends. Tell Abu Jal, go bring his boys. And we're going to bring our angels. That's literally what it means. Nadia Nadia means uh, the place where, the marketplace where they would have their meetings and stuff. Uh, the, Allah says, you know, let him bring his boys. We'll bring, we will bring the angels of hellfire uh, for him. Okay? So, this is what is happening. So, look. There is an epistemic battle happening in Arabia and this ayah is actually a direct attack on the value system of, Arab on, of Arabian society. It's a direct attack on them. Your knowledge, which is from the forefathers, is useless. Even your claim that you, know, you are the elite of Mecca, you know how to read and write and so on, is not, not from you. He is the one who taught you how to do all of this. Okay, so that is another discussion that has ended. In the Sira series, I went a bit more detail on this topic so you can get the link from the uh, committee okay let's move on now ayah 6 7 and 8 kalla inna al insana la yatgha ar raha ustaghna inna ila rabbika ruj'a over here i will just explain the meaning of the word kalla reason why i'm mentioning uh, going over this kalla because it will appear multiple times in this surah and it appears in many other places of the quran many many times so I might as well just tell you the meaning of it and that way every time it comes I don't have to go through it again and again. Kalla has two possible meanings. Either it means definitely, you know, haqqan, definitely, or it means no, you know, like definitely not. So two possible meanings. And that is, you know, it's not anything absurd. Like um, you can have a word when it's used in different contexts, it can have different meanings. Okay, for example, like, I don't know, some slang we use, like, yo, that's so sick. Sick, you know, if you use it in a certain context, you know, you say that person is sick, it means they're ill. But if, you know, if some of the youth are saying, you know, that's so sick, it means that's amazing. So it's possible you can use the word in different meanings, but depending on the context. So in this surah also, it will be used in both of these meanings, depending on the context, okay? So the first uh, use over here, ayah number six, it means definitely. Kalla. Inna al insana la yatqa means definitely insan is doing transgression because they see themselves as uh, you know sufficient and needless. And then in ayah 14 it means no. You know, no. Ayah 14 it means no. And then ayah number 18, which is the last ayah, the wajib says the one, it again means definitely. Okay, so it's actually being used in both of these meanings. Now, what does it mean here? Kalla in al insana la I already said, you know, Allah al insana ma lam ya'lam. Allah taught insan that which he did not know. Definitely, despite all of this, definitely insan is doing tughiyan. Because they continue to see themselves as needless. 
that's what it ends up meaning. Okay. Now, once again, we'll come back to another discussion. Actually, let me see if I can postpone this for next session because there are some other discussions I wanted to do. Like the Balagha one. You know, I'll come back, I'll, I'll, I'll do this, uh, this one is also good, but I'll do this maybe next week. But I, I really wanted to do the Balagha of this ayah, of the this, of this surah. So let's, let's do that, inshallah. So for that, let's try and look at this entire surah. Okay? So you have, so the way I do it is I try to turn the ayat of a surah into different scenes. Okay? Imagine them as movie scenes. Okay? And that's not blasphemy. So you can imagine them as movie scenes. Okay? Why? Why? Because, uh, interestingly, I, I read a scholar, one of, the, one of the ayatollahs in Qum. He said something very interesting. Uh, he said, you know, the miracle of the previous prophets, if you look at the nature of the previous prophets' miracles, like Prophet Isa alayhi salam, you know, uh, reviving the dead, or if they are sick, you know, he can cure them. Or Prophet Musa alayhi salam, his staff. All of these miracles are very, very empirical. You know, people observe them. Yeah, you know, this person just died and Isa brought him back. Or he was paralyzed, Isa cured him. Uh, you know, Musa, you know, through his staff or the Nile split. These are all very, very empirical uh, miracles. And they are very convincing. But the miracle of the Qur'an is not empirical. It is completely in the mind. And how you understand. Like it, requires you to, it actually requires you to think a little bit. It's a very interesting. Okay? And there's a whole discussion over there on the khatimi of the Prophet. You know, the fi fi finality of the Prophet. You know, question like, why did the Prophethood end with Prophet Muhammad? Like, one of the reasons they mention is because the human societies had reached a level where now they actually don't need a prophet. Like the prophet brought them, they came at a time where he left them with a miracle which requires the intellect to be able to perceive it. So when these ayat are being revealed, you know, these are all oral. They're not like some text, prophet saying, ha, ye parlo, like read this. And neither is the prophet going home and like, you know, devising, ha, let me see, should I put this sentence first and you know, which one's going to sound cooler? No, these are just immediately revelations coming and then he goes and he reveals them to them. I want to show you, you know, what many of us will miss out due to the fact that we are unfamiliar with the Arabic language, okay? I want to quote from, you know, grade 10, we read a book called Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens, okay? Uh, I don't know how many of you have read that book, Tale of Two Cities. Tale of Two Cities is a very important book, like in, in like uh, literature, like it's a book. But maybe many of, you, many of you have heard the beginning lines of it because it's a very famous, it's a cliche if you want to call it. Uh, and I want you to uh, just listen to the beginning paragraphs of this book. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens you must have heard because he's always on the Imam Hussein poster, you know. They always put him there with Gandhi. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Okay, this is how the book actually starts. When you're hearing this, isn't your mind going up and down? You know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was light and darkness. Look how quickly you are visualizing this because you know English. Okay, it's, it's not any, any even complicated English. Imagine this is happening like, you know, 20 times more in the Arabic language, in the Quran, okay? So I'm going to try and do that for you <laughs> to the best of my abilities to show you how this, a very similar thing is happening in the surah. Not comparing Charles Dickens with the Quran, but just to kind of get our minds closer to what is happening, okay? So for that purpose, you can turn the surah into... Uh, you know, like six, seven scenes where like the, the, the camera is shifting. So it starts like this. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. When you say Iqra, Jibrail is talking directly to the Prophet. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Meaning, read in the name of your Lord who created. So your mind goes to this creation and there's no object being, being mentioned. Created what? So when an object is not mentioned, it actually just means the, the, the greatness of his creation. You know, worship the God who created. Created what? This not mentioning of a creation, the object, shows how, like, He just created everything. Okay? 
read in the name of your, your Lord who created. So your mind is going to this like this entire creation. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ So your mind comes back straight down to insan. He created man, not just man, but created them from a blood clot. So he like zooms right back into the blood clot. Okay? خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ اِقْرَى وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ Okay, read and your Lord is very generous. الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ Okay, so now, okay, now, you know, the humans are, insan is growing and they're learning. عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught this man, this human, that which they did not know. Now, next scene, you know, كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى So all the care that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to this person, you know, he's created, he's being generous, he's taught him, he's brought him here. Now imagine this human here, كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى This same person is doing tughyan, he has no shame. Why? أَرَّهَا أُسْتَغْنَى He sees, this person sees himself as needless. Even though I'm telling you, I'm the one who created you, I'm the Rabb, and your continuity is also dependent on me. Inna ila rabbika ruj'a. Where do you think you're going? Ruj'a is from like raja, like return. You know, we created you, but you're coming back. You're, you're not detached from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're coming back. Okay? So it's painting a very harsh picture. A lot of care, but yet this insan is doing istagna. istagna. Why? Because he sees himself as, uh, sorry, tughyan, because he sees himself as uh, mustaghni. Okay, so now this insan is being described, okay, almost in like this vacuum. It's not on earth anywhere, right? Now, all of a sudden, it comes back onto planet earth, where it's speaking about, now it's referring to the incident where Abu Jahl was preventing the Holy Prophet from praying. Remember I said last the session? I was going to say last episode. That's for the Mizan recordings, you know, in the previous episode. Last session, uh, uh, we, uh, we talked about how the surah was revealed because Abu Jahl was preventing the Holy Prophet from praying in the, in the vicinity of the Kaaba. We spoke about that. So now, Jibreel is telling the Prophet, uh, revealing the ayat, and it's making the Prophet recall that event. Okay? أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَا عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى أَرَأَيْتَ literally means, do you see? But over here it actually means, tell me, tell me, okay, tell me, actually that, I think that's how they translate it as well, you know, tell me, uh, right, yeah, tell me, tell me, you need, you need the prophet, tell me about the person who was preventing the slave of Allah from praying. So it is actually even making the Prophet see his own self as a, as an, as an, as a separate entity. Okay, Abdan means slave of Allah. Okay, slave over here is being used in a very respectful way, by the way, for the Prophet. The Prophet is being called a slave. O Prophet, tell me about that man, meaning Abu Jahal, who is preventing the slave of Allah from praying. Tell me if this man, meaning Abu Jahal, whether he was on hidayah, whether he is guided, or whether he commands to taqwa. O Prophet, tell me whether this person lies or he runs away. Does he not know that Allah is watching him? Okay? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about insan. Insan is doing tughyan. Why? Because he's mustaghni. He sees himself as mustaghni. He doesn't need anyone. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming and applying it on this specific individual who's Abu Jahl. He's saying this individual who sees himself as needless, you know, does he not realize that Allah is watching him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. Whether he goes to guidance, whether he becomes guided and begins to do Amr bil Taqwa, meaning he uh, does Amr bil Ma'roof basically, or whether he begins or whether he continues to lie and turn away from your commands and admonishments. Do they, does this person not know, does this insan over here, in this, in this earth over here, does he not know that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him? Okay. Now, it gets even harsher. Kalla. So this kalla over here means no. This insan has no clue Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. He's so heedless, he's so into his, you know, this feeling of entitlement, that kalla, you know, he, is not, he does not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. Look, these ayah, that's why I said it's a, the literary, the literary tafsir is very, very important. It's the most basic foundational form of tafsir because yara, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have eyes. We know that. It's not a body. But yet the verbs that are being used give you that feeling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. That's a very like, scary feeling. 
You know, if, if our parents are watching us, you know, do some sharar thing, like, you know, we're being naughty, and our parents are watching, we get so scared. Because they're, they're watching, somebody's watching. This thing, does he not know Allah is watching? So it's a very close feeling, right? It's not somebody just watching from far, like, over the mountains. No, yara means from your eyes, like, he's watching you. No, he does not know. And if he does not stop, if he does not stop, we will hold him by the forelock. Sorry, we will, we will, yeah, we will hold him by the forelock. Forelock is this part of the head, like the hair, the front of the hair. A lot of Arab, like Arab men used to have long hair. Like up until the show, even the Prophet it says, he had long hair. So they would have a forelock, you can easily grab them. And this is, uh, you know, a, uh, what they call a kinaya. Kinaya, I don't know what they call it in English. A, me a metonym or something, I don't remember right now. But kinaya is like a metaphor, it's almost like a metaphor where they would hold the forelock of the horses, like the mane. So you know, you hold a, a horse and you drag them. This is uh, taken from that usage, which was very familiar to the Arabs, and is using it over here. We will hold him, we will seize him by the, his forelock. A forelock which is a lying and a mistaken forelock. This is also one of the discussions I wanted to, I want to do. What do you mean? How can the hair be lying? <laughs> right? How can the hair be lying and mistaken? And so on the discussion. We will hold him by his forelock, this forelock which is lying, and then it's a third person. It's as if like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not even looking at this guy anymore. You know, as if like Allah turns away, you know, uh, not literally, but as if like, you know, the, the third person pronoun here is being used, you know, turn away from him, you know, let him bring his men, you know, we'll bring our angels. Let him bring his men, we'll bring our angels. And the last ayah, which we haven't recited obviously, it tells to the Prophet, you on the other hand, definitely don't obey him. In fact, do sajda and seek proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The entire surah, as I said, was revealed because the Prophet was prevented from praying in the Kaaba. If you look at the surah, it starts with Iqra. Read, you start Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, read in the name of your Lord, it's as if like the entire salat is packaged in the surah. Start with the bismillah and with the sajda. Okay? In the middle is this entire destruction of the, it's almost like, uh, you know, surah al-Fatiha, sirat al an'amta alayhim ghayl al-maghdubi alayhim wal You know, in the beginning there's blessings mentioned. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you all of these uh, qualities. And ghayl al-maghdubi alayhim wal And in the middle there's all of this description of, you know, humans which are feeling, you know, have no sense of humility, they're arrogant and so on. And this entire surah is very similar thematically to Surah Al-Fatiha. You know, not, not that close, but I'm just talking about the themes over here. It's very interesting. So you see like the entire surah is packaged with the beginning and the end, ending with the sajda. So this is the, uh, the eloquence of the surah. So as I said, I tried to do my best over here, but as I said, if you can, you know, uh, I I visualize it in your mind, because that's how the Arab Mushrikeen would have visualized it. And that's why they were freaking out. Because they are like, how is somebody coming with this? You know, and how quickly are these shifts happening? The visualization is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking you to a, you know, almost like into, this, into space. And then coming back on earth. And then, you know, we'll grab him by the forelock, which, are, which, is, a, which is a very visual punishment. And then, you know, I don't even care about him. I don't want to look at him. You know, it doesn't say... I will, you know, you call your men, I will, we will call our men. No, he's not, Allah is not even addressing him as you. It's like, no, let him call his men. Let him call his men, we will call our angels, okay? So this is the Balaga point I wanted to mention. Let me see which one is a shorter discussion I can uh, do over here. Because uh, there is one, two more discussions. Okay, I'll do this one and I'll end it with this one today. Grabbing by the forelock. Okay, grabbing by the forelock. The nasiya. Nasiya means grabbing by the forelock, okay? Uh, so, grabbing by the forelock uh, in Arabic, this phrase, you know, akh bin nasiya, grabbing the forelock, is an indication of authority and control. That's what it indicates. Okay, when you grab something by the, by the forelock, it means you have control over them. So the Arabs had two of these phrases either grabbing by the forelock or grabbing by the shin. And both of these were things that they had taken from the, uh, the, their, their interaction with the animals. Okay, so the animals, for example, they would drag them or tie them with the, their ropes on the shin, 
or they will grab them by the forelock. So this is taken from, from that, right? So over here indicates the same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, I will grab him by the forelock, meaning showing how helpless this person is. Instead of feeling you know, needless, Allah is showing he's helpless. He's, he can't do anything. You know, I will just grab him by the forelock. Because when you hold an animal, bichara, the animal is so uh, hopeless, helpless, cannot do anything. He's so powerless. The animal is so powerless. That's the sort of meaning that is being given over here. And <coughs> the next ayah which says, you know, the, the forelock which is a kaziba and khati'a. It is lying. Kaziba means a liar. Khati'a means from khata meaning mistake, right? Question here is that how can the hair be lying? How can the forelock be lying and mistaken? In Arabic, this is called saying a juz, saying a particular, but intending the kul, intending the full thing, okay? For example, in Arabic, when you want to free a slave, you say, free the neck. That's literally what you have to say, okay? Free the neck. What do you mean, like if there's a slave and you know, you just free the neck, like the body is still enslaved? No. You say free the neck because the neck is essentially the, uh, it indicates the entire person. It indicates that entire human. So they would use, but you know, this idea of slave, slavery, you know, when they would uh, grab these slaves, they would, you know, tie them with the, with the necks, like chain them and so on. So when they say free the neck, they really just mean, yeah, free the whole person. But it's a, the way of saying it is like that. Okay, so likewise here, when it's saying the nausea will grab the nausea and you know drag the, the nausea, does not mean we'll just drag the hair, like no, the whole body is being, the whole person is being dragged, okay. Now nausea tin kadibatin khatia also means that. A nausea which is uh, lying and is mistaken, meaning the person is a liar and mistaken, not the, not the hair, okay. Over here, I'll mention this last discussion and inshallah we'll end. I have. I, I also alluded to it last session as well. You know, there is in the from the 19th century onwards, there has been um, you know scientific interpretations of the Quran. Okay, inshallah, when we get time for that, I will have a whole discussion on that. Very important discussion. Scientific interpretations of the Quran, and you know, do do such a thing even exist or not, right? But anyways, from Egypt it began, and then Turkey and these regions they started to do scientific tafasir. Okay. So for example, like uh, Surah Al-Fil Ababil, when we do this, inshallah, we'll get to that. Tarmihim bi hijaratim min sijil. They said, no, these Ababil are not birds. What do you mean all these birds came and they had stones with fire? They said, no, this has to be a plague. So it's like started turning them into like scientific things, like things that are visible, physical, uh, doesn't have any supernatural you know, uh, aspect to it. Anyways, so one of the scholars, a uh, Sunni scholar, Yemeni Sheikh, his name is Abdul Majid Al-Zindani. He's the head of the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood. So these are scholars as well. He over here pushed for a scientific interpretation. Okay, because he said, what do you mean uh, nausea, which is lying and mistaken? He could not understand it. He said, no, no, this cannot be, you know, this cannot mean that, uh, you know, the nausea is a forelock and it means the whole human. He says, no, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word nausea, so it must mean the hair. So how can the hair be, you know, lying? He says, lo and behold, you know, science has discovered that in the frontal lobe of the body, like that's where all the like that's where all the decisions are made by humans. Okay, I don't know, I don't have no clue if that's true or not, but you know, that's what they're saying that you know the, this part of the brain actually makes all the decisions. Okay, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when He says nasiya nasiya tin kadiba tin meaning this person his brain is like making mistakes, he, his frontal lobe is making mistakes, and that is what we're gonna grab. Meaning we're gonna we're gonna judge this person based on the decisions that they were making. Okay, so it's a pretty you know pretty cool uh, interpretation. Look, this is not how you do tafsir. It's not how you do tafsir. Okay. We have to see, cause look, oh man, that's a whole discussion. I don't know what did I touch here, but uh, this is not correct. Okay, and that's not correct because we have to go to the Arabian society and see how did they use it. What did they mean by this? Okay, and we are saying that look, what they meant by this phrase is not the brain. Their use of this phrase was to indicate authority over the entity, over the animal. Not that it's talking about the brain. Otherwise, you're going to end up saying that yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant the brain, but for like 1400 years, like no one, not even the mushrikeen, the audience that is supposed to understand, even they didn't understand this. Right? So they were mistaken in their understanding. 
This is the problem you're gonna end up running into if you do scientific tafasir, by the way. Again and again, you're gonna end up running into these problems, right? Because this language is speaking to the audience over there. They have to understand what, what this ayah means. If this ayah me meant the frontal lobe, who knew frontal lobe at that time? Okay, so otherwise you're saying that they understood an ambiguous meaning. Then listen, the, the book is not clear then. It's using ambiguous meaning that we are supposed to have figured it out like you know, 14 centuries later. So this is these type of inconsistencies you may run into over here, okay? So we go to the Arabic language, we look at the poetry, we look at their usage, and we realize that no, nasiya tin kadibatin, sorry, nasiya, akhl bin nasiya means that you have authority over that, for example, animal or over that person, and so on and so forth. That is something that is very important. And there are two ayat in the Quran, I will mention this, I'll wrap it up from this. Surah Rahman, ayah 41, okay? Uh, يُعْرِفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ Mujrimun. The, the criminals will be recognized on the Day of Judgment. بِسِيمَاهُمْ فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاسِ وَالْأَقْدَامِ The evil people will be recognized by their appearances on the Day of Judgment. Then they will be seized by their forelocks and feet. Okay, why? Showing that they are uh, helpless. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the angels have complete authority over these individuals, the criminals. So they will be seized by them. What does it have to do with the, the brain? Okay, the brain, the brain and the feet? No, it's talking about like authority. Even the aqdam, the feet, it's trying to show that they are hopeless, helpless. Uh, over here, Surah Hud, Ayah 56. إِنِّي تَوَكَّلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ رَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ مَا, ما مِنْ دَابَّةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ آخِذٌ بِنَاصِيَتِهَا إِنَّ رَبِّي عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ I place my trust in Allah who is my Lord and your Lord. There is no creature, there is no uh, creature, creature, but Allah holds it by the forelock. Surely my Lord is on a straight path. What does this mean? There is no creation. Uh, Daba means like an like a animal creation, not, not necessarily humans. But Allah is holding it by the forelock. Okay, Allah literally is holding it, uh, animals by the forelock. No, Allah is, meaning Allah has complete authority and control over the uh, animal kingdom. Okay, all, this is what I'm saying. That the surah you can see over there. Otherwise, you will say uh, there is, you know, there is no creation of Allah except Allah holds it by the brain, or like animal brains. Like you know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So as I said, if we can be consistent over here. Uh, and over here, uh, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we will hold him and seize him by the nasiyah, by the forelock, meaning he will be completely hopeless and helpless. You know, he was doing tughiyan and seeing himself as needless. We will hold him and show him how, you know, useless he was. And he was not only useless, but he was a kadiba and he was a, uh, he was kadiba, he was khatih. He was a liar and he was mistaken. So there are three more discussions in this surah at the very least that I haven't done, but uh, I really wanted to do the, uh, the Balaga one. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we finished that. So my plan is not to, you know, as you can see, like I'm not trying to uh, drag the surah, like, you know, every single word and, you know, let's expand like 20 pages on that. No, no. I want to keep moving at a good pace. So inshallah, if next session we can even finish this, I will start surah Mudathir, which is the next surah. Like I will start it. You know, I'm not going to be like, okay, in 30 minutes we finish it up. So like next week, no, no. I will try to keep push as, as quick as we can at, at, at a decent pace, inshallah. Okay? وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين